All right, welcome to another lab on acids and bases. All right, and there I am. Do you remember my name? Perhaps. Oh, and there is somebody very famous, and that is an ulterior motive for this video. Uh, you are going to be writing a paper this term on a famous chemist. You're also going to do a chemistry demo. Uh, so hopefully within the slideshow, it might give you some ideas. A famous chemist. Do you know who that famous chemist is? And yeah, wonderful talk and paper you can do. They're not long. And it gives a chance to listen to somebody other than me. All right. So we're going to do a review or an intro to acids and bases, depending on when you watch this. Uh, so acids, of course, are not sweet, but they are tart. In fact, the word acidus means sour in, I believe, Greek. We could say Egyptian, but only major would know then. All right, so anytime you're going to have something that is very sour that makes you look like that, that is telling you there's an acid in there. And so what we do is we load up on the sugar because we would rather have something be sweet. And the thing that's interesting is we've made ourselves extremely acidic on the inside because of all the sugar. Should have stuck with the straight orange. Uh, so we put a danger sign and that danger sign should be on the sugar because if you test sugar in the test tube, which is what you're gonna be doing in this lab, it's gonna say, oh, the pH is neutral. But that other lab you're doing on yourself where you're not having sugar for a week or the whole month, you'll be happy. Uh, battery acid. So when we talk about car batteries, car batteries have sulfur, Puric acid in them, and acids are corrosive. And so that's another picture of the sign for acids because they corrode and they would corrode your hands. So that's why in the live videos, when I actually am in lab, I have gloves on, and so would you. Uh, and acids are also corrosive to your teeth. So somebody, you know, this would be a tough demo to do because you really don't want to pull your teeth out and soak them in that. The thing that's really sad, I've, I've actually done this with an, a raw egg because it will eat away at the eggshell. So you put it in different acids. The one that was terribly disgusting and it worked, but it was more what happened because I forgot about the eggs and left them in for a long time, uh, was those energy drinks that you guys eat. Anyway, some ideas for some demos you could do also. Uh, acid rain, and the pH of the rain is not right, and that is due to all that smog. And of course, our tummy acid, one of the most acidic places on this planet is inside of us, inside of our stomach. Uh, the pH is extremely low, like one to two, and that is because of hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid, there is a reason the pH of our stomach is that low, because that is when digestive enzymes work that work in our stomach. So our proteolytic, the uh, pr peptidases, the ones that um, digest our proteins, those enzymes only work at an extremely acidic pH and uh, also absorption of calcium and vitamin B12 happens in this extremely acidic pH. And so everybody taking acids to counteract the acidity in their stomach Oh, what's happening to their digestion of proteins? Something to ponder. All right. So we'll talk about acid rain just briefly. Acid rain is a problem. I had a student many, many years ago before many of you were born. So like my first or second year teachings, this is 25 years ago. And even more mind boggling to me is the student would now be like 45. And yeah, very young. Anyway. The title of his report was A Sad Story of Socks and Ox. Don't you want to be that student who writes a report in 25 years? I'm talking about you. Think of all the love you'll be feeling. All right. Uh, so our sulfur oxides and our nitrous oxides. So it could be NO, NO2, NO3, and any of them. But what happens is they're released into the air from pollution and uh, from our tailpipe, from pollution. There are some natural sources, but the vast majority are man-made and these combine with water vapor and make sulfuric acid and nitric acid and decrease the pH of the rain. And it's not that pH that kills the, the trees, it changes then the pH of the soil and that kills the trees. 
um, and it changes the pH of the lakes, and that kills the fish. And then the thing that's really making people upset is it dissolves marble because that is calcium, magnesium carbonate, I believe. Uh, so the Greek statues or the Taj Mahal won't be there in a decade, they predict, because it is marble. Um, so egad. All right. So yin and yang acids have their counterpart, their balance point, which are bases. And so the original term for bases was alkali. Uh, so the prefix AL means it is Middle Eastern, uh, the term, and Kali is potassium. Uh, and so anything that neutralizes effervesces with acids and turns litmus blue and is caustic, which means it burns you and me, it eats away at metal. And so we would see the warning. Uh, alkali batteries have bases in them, KOH or NaOH, and we'll get to that when we do electrochemical cells. And these are your cleaning products. So whether it's window cleaner or spick and span or Drano, these are bases. So the taste of acids is sour. The taste of bases is bitter. So bases are bitter. So anything that makes you go bitter, mm, that is a base, which is our beloved dark chocolate. Have I mentioned yet how much I love dark chocolate? So alkaloids are plant-made bases. Uh, so they are what they have in common, if you look at the wonderful molecules, is it is the nitrogen. And it is because of that 2s2, 2p3 configuration of the nitrogen that allows it to act as a base. Uh, so, so many useful um, alkaloids, and it is because they are actually slightly poisonous. Uh, coffee is included in here, the caffeine and coffee, which just have a bitter taste that we love. Um, yeah. All right. Moving through the matrix here. Uh, famous chemist number one. So this guy came up with our classic definition. Uh, what he's more famous for is this equation that you learned about in chemistry 222. Uh, he studied activation energy and his, um, yeah. He, so spontaneous, he came up, he did a lot of stuff. He came up with our classic definition that most of us know of acids and bases, which is that an acid donates hydrogen ion and a base donates hydroxide ion. The reason it's not perfect is it assumes you're in water because water is actually hydrogen and a hydroxide ion. Uh, and so if you were not in water, well, considering you and I are water-based and this planet is water-based, if we go to another planet, we need a better definition. Right? He wins the Nobel Prize in 1903. The first Nobel Prize was 1901. Alfred Nobel was a chemist, by the way. Pretty fun to research him. Uh, anyway, Arrhenius, his ideas were so important that they named a crater on the moon after him. How cool is that? And he also was, I believe, the first scientist to come up with the idea of the greenhouse effect. And so this is over 100 years ago. He said, hey, all this stuff with industrialization is creating this glass window over the planet and we're changing the temperature. I was not here in Portland, there in Portland, I'm still here in New Jersey, when you guys had the 117, can't even imagine. Um, all right, the definition we will be using is the Bronsted-Lowry definition. Uh, that is Dr. Bronsted. And this definition, it looks similar. Acids donate hydrogen ion, but how they interpret it, there we go these two gentlemen, is acids are a proton donor, because again, hydrogen ion is actually a proton, uh, and bases are a proton acceptor. Uh, and then we get our third definition, which is Gilbert Lewis, another famous chemist, and most famous for his Lewis structures. So you can see the first ones, his original handwriting and stuff of his Lewis structures. Um, and so since he was obsessed with electrons, is he said that he flips it and so acids whereas we will be doing acids are a proton donator they would also be an electron acceptor 
So since electrons are negative and bases were be an electron pair donor. And so that picture of the nitrogen, this is why nitrogen by any of these definitions is a base. The nitrogen always, because of those five electrons, valence electrons, three of them bond, and then you have that lone pair. Boron doesn't make it to an octet unless it gets a little help from its friend, nitrogen. And it makes this special bond between the nitrogen and boron is called a coordinate covalent bond. It means both electrons in the bond were donated by the nitrogen. It should be a bonus question in your lab. What do you think? Because you actually listen to me. All right. Or you could choose to do one of these famous chemists, right? So Dr. Russell, uh, there's usually some in class at him. Dr. Whitman, some of you have for 221, our lovely Bernadette. And then hopefully you know who I am by now. And that's Mount Hood in the background. All right. Moving on. Uh, could do the chemistry cat, right? That would be a famous chemist. Might be one of the most famous. So a uh, problem I have with this slide is they, a lot of places put chloric acid as a strong acid. I don't think it's a strong acid. Um, perchloric definitely is. And the difference between our strong acids and our weak acids, this slide actually shows it really nicely in the lower left-hand corner. The strong acid uh, completely dissociates. So the water, again, we don't say ionize, we say dissociates. The water pulls all the hydrogens off. And so the problem I have is the hydrogen ions. There is no such thing as hydrogen ions. That hydrogen always com is combined with the water because the water pulls it off. So you actually have hydronium ion, but that would confuse people because you'd have to actually take chemistry to know that. Uh, a weak acid is only partially, it's an equilibrium. It's why we have to do equilibrium first. And this whole term looks at equilibrium equanimity. All right. We talked about this, acids and bases. So this is what you're going to be doing in your experiment. And you're going to test some common household stuff, whatever you have in your house. You're not going to get your stomach acid. Please don't do that. Um, and you're going to find the pH. And so uh, tomato, if, oh, before I mention that. So another famous chemist. This is actually fascinating to me because I did not know this until like three years ago, really, that um, I had just always taken it for granted, the pH scale. It's just always been there. Like God made it in that first moment, right? Uh, but no, it was actually 1909. Of course, it's a man-made concept that is much easier to talk about a pH scale as the negative logarithm of hydrogen ion concentration. And so it's easier to say, okay, tomatoes are a four and eight or lemon is a two. And so the lower the pH, the more acidic, the higher the pH, the more alkaline or basic. Uh, and then, of course, now there's a pOH scale, which we'll be talking about in class. So uh, most people have a pH meter. There'll probably be an app on your phone that you could do this. And you could stick it into some tomato juice and say, oh, look, it's a pH of 4.15. It's acidic. And then do that with lemon juice and we'd be done with the lab. But we don't have that app yet. So you guys are going to make a pH indicator. So this is how it was done in the old days is that they found different chemical compounds and they made them into pieces of paper and the paper would change based on the pH. So if you have something like methyl violet at the top of the screen, it's a pH indicator for extremely acidic conditions. So it's yellow only at a pH below one and above that it's purple. If we go down to the bottom, uh, the phenolphthalein second from the bottom is what we used in class when we used to do lab, um, that it's going to be a colorless. There's no color. And then suddenly the pH of nine, boom, you see this light pink color. And that gets darker and darker and darker. And you were trying to get it where it was that first hint of light pink color. So you knew you were at the equivalence point. Uh, but since we're not in lab, you guys are going to make it from food. Uh, so all different things. So beets, I love beets. Apparently they're very red, acidic, and they get more of that lovely purplish color as they become more basic. Uh, curry powder. Uh, tomatoes apparently have different color based on pH. Onions. And so nobody ever has done this, but extracting different types of natural pH indicators and checking them with um 
some of the stuff in your house and seeing the color change. So some of the soap products would show uh, like the curry powder would be red with a soap product because they tend to have really high pH, but an acidic product like lemon, you would see the curry powder apparently would be white, but all right. Uh, the most famous one is litmus paper, and that actually comes from lichen. So my meditation tree that I can see outside my window at my mom's is does have this lichen on it. And so the little mantra is acids are red. So that's specifically with litmus paper. If we look at the previous slide, you can see different indicators are not always red. A lot of them are red in acidic conditions, and then the blue or the greens in basic. Uh, but litmus is the most famous, and in acids like oranges, it turns pink, and in something that is basic, which would be like Windex, it would turn blue. And that gnome is just so adorable, and I'm going to have to try and find him. All right, that gnome is also cute. Uh, that is hydrangea, which many of us have in our yards. I have one in my yard. That hopefully is blossoming right now. And the color of the blossoms tells you the pH of the soil. So the flower actually contains a chemical compound that changes molecular structure with the pH of the soil. And depending on the shape of that structure, you either see the deep dark blue or the lighter blue, or some are pink and white. Um, so it tells you the pH of the soil. What you're going to be using in your kitchen chemistry lab is cabbage. Now my dog would actually not look like that. My dog loves red cabbage and you can find it at any of the stores. Uh, and so this is a lab I did with kids for 11 years, 12 years. I did this past year in my garage. Apparently I have to do it again this next year. Uh, so you're going to make the indicator from red cabbage. You're going to cook up some red cabbage and then you strain it and you use the juice, which will have a purple color, the neutral in the middle. And when you add it to things that are acidic, you get different shades of reddish or light purple. And when you add it to things that are bases, that's when you get the fun colors, the blues, the greens and the yellows. Uh, and actually, if you look, you can see there's the picture of the molecule and you'd have to really discern it. Uh, but the, the shape of the molecule, there is a free electron that floats around depending on the pH. And that free electron, then um, how it reflects light is how you're seeing the different colors. And so that's how pH indicators are going to work. And so your experiment is you're going to try what you've got in the house, um, different things. These are all different things that we've tried, Drano, if you have it, soap, um, you know, different soaps are going to give you different colors. Uh, and you're, you're, it, it is hard because we are so fascinated with color that most substances already have a color. But it is interesting because when you add the cabbage juice to orange juice, you will no longer have orange. Milk also will change a color. Uh, beer or wine. And so there's Dr. Whitman when she got her tenure, we went to celebrate. Uh, and you can also, if you want, you can make a really fun design with your cabbage, um, make an elephant or something, some other cool design and take a picture and put in your lab. And yeah, bonus points are really fun. It's really the only reason being playful. It's the whole purpose of life. You're also going to try color blending. And this is the thing that's interesting. So if you take red and blue, paint you get violet right we all did that in kindergarten if you take red which is extremely acidic and blue which is slightly basic you're not going to get violet necessarily or if you take green and red um you will get violet not black like this thing shows us the trick is to get orange because if you mix yellow and red you're not going to get orange yellow is extremely basic red is extremely acidic you're going to get in the middle because you're going to neutralize it uh, so there are bonuses, already mentioned. You can make an elephant with the olive and beet. Uh, and it is try to get the rainbows. This is what I did with some kids before COVID. This is actually just like a month before we got closed down. You can see orange is actually a color that is hardest to get, but they did do the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, uh, the indigo. By the time we take the picture, it's hard to see. And, you know, 
So last year there were, they, they figured out ways to get orange. So you're not using food coloring, but you can also mix two things. And there was actually a really clever way. There were a couple people who got uh, the closest to a true orange that I've seen. Or peach color, you can also eat the rainbow every day for the week, for the whole term. Remember, you're doing that and you're going to be so healthy and happy. And by the way, if you're eating the rainbow, or if you want to just do it for a week for this lab, uh, it's not that you eat one color each day. It's every day you're eating every color. It's wonderful this time of the year because blue is easy to get because blueberries are in season. I can't wait to be back and have Oregon blueberries. All right. So. Can you say anthocyanin? I can. It means a dark blue flower in Greek. And it is anytime you see food with that deep purple color, it is anthocyanin. And it is a molecule that changes color with pH because of that electron that moves around. And the cabbage, when you're done with it, and even after you make your beautiful elephant or whatever you're going to create, uh, you should eat the cabbage. And actually, there you go. There's another bonus hidden in this video is make the like most beautiful meal with your cabbage. Like could be a cabbage salad. You could bring it even to the coffee shop where I'm at and share it. Uh, you make a cabbage soup. You can make something different every day with the cabbage and take a picture of you with your new exciting meal. And right, we won the colors of the rainbow. So can you get all seven colors of the rainbow with your cabbage? Um, and take a picture of the meal and put it in your lab. Wouldn't that be awesome? So why you should eat more anthocyanin is it boosts your brain. And that would be really important when you're taking a chemistry course in half the time. And it's already Chem 223, which is already a really tough class because you guys are all so amazingly awesome and brilliant. And you're going to all do amazing and awesome and brilliant anyway, because you're going to all eat healthy for the 30 days and it also makes you more useful. So the term aging is really, we shouldn't be using that term. We should be talking about you think that, right? Saying, how old are you? Saying, how young are you? All right, boost learning and memory, a good thing. Like we've all lost the capacity to memorize because we don't have to in online school. And yeah, don't eat this. This is the fake sugars. It's, they're so bad for you. Yeah. The cat's even saying, oh, my goodness, there it is. There's a wonderful molecule. Remember, all those corners are carbons. And, yeah, great for your eye health. Uh, promotes immunity. Really important for all times. Uh, your heart, cancer, it, like, fights cancer. And it fights the common cold. Imagine if you eat it every day. Oh, and it will not turn you blue or purple. So don't worry about that. So eat purple to be more youthful. And because you're doing a lab in the kitchen, and by the way, this is your only kitchen chemistry lab. Um, the other ones, you get to watch videos of me and do stuff. Yeah, how, all right. Um, so safety first, don't be like Johnny. Don't drink your experiment, please. And it's for you, Captain Max. Because you actually admitted to me how much you loved the home chemistry. Your attitude is important, as is your attire. So here we go. Um, so notice this is my twin brother and the evil twin, right? And he's wearing goggles. So if I had been on campus, which I will be in the fall, I will be standing there doing this demo the very first day. So... Uh, major, you remember this probably, and there's our classroom, and there's our periodic table, and so I'm way far away um, wearing goggles also. So this is the gummy bear in the potassium chlorate. You guys could do this demo. You'd have to do it outside. Um, we have ways to do it and videotape it, and yeah, just talk to me with ideas. All right. Uh, don't be unsupervised. Oh, but you are because none of your favorite chemists are there. None of your chemistry teachers will be there. So hopefully nothing dreadful will happen to you. Um, and don't eat, drink, or chew gum, even if your chemistry teacher is offering you some lovely plastic fish to eat. And if you injure accident, uh, we don't want to hear about it. 
we don't want to see it. Just don't tell us because we're not there. And don't make a mess. Clean up. Clean up your kitchen. Please clean up your kitchen. Dr. Whitman's giving you all a thumbs up there. Uh, I'm not there. If I was in your kitchen, I'd make a bigger mess than you. So you don't want me in your kitchen. All right. Well, namaste. Have fun. I can't wait to see your lab reports. And ta-ta for now.